On behalf of the Lower Free Public Library, I would like to welcome you all tonight for an evening with Frederick Smock, our newest poet laureate in Kentucky. Fred is a, a Louisville native. He graduated from Georgetown College and the University of Louisville. He served as professor of English at Bellarmine College. And for 15 years, he edited the American Voice, an international literary journal. Those papers are housed in the Duke University archives. Mr. Smock has published 10 books of poems and essays. Two new books are forthcoming. Book of Early De Earthly Delights, poems from Marx for Press, and On Poetry, Palm of the Hand Essays from Broadstone Books. His awards include the 2002 Henry Leadingham Poetry Prize, the 2003 Jim Wayne Miller Prize for Poetry, the 2005 Bellarmine University Wyatt Faculty Award, and the 2008 Kentucky Literary Award for Poetry. In 1995, the Kentucky Arts Council awarded him the Al Smith Fellowship in Poetry. So it, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Frederick Smock this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a... Thank you very much, and thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, it's wonderful to see all of you. Um, and um, I, I want to say, first off, that um, um, you can never see this sort of thing coming. It's not something you can apply for. They find you and then just sort of tell you that, that this is what it's going to be. Uh, and, um, and I will say to you guys, uh, when the ceremony was planned uh, and it's assumed that the governor is going to show up and, and induct you. Uh, my older son asked me if I was going to have to shake hands with him. <laughs> um, but let me say that um, he, did, he did arrive uh, the first time anyone could remember a governor actually showing up to one of these ceremonies. Uh, he had read my work. He had intelligent and generous things to say about it. And in person, I found him to be smart and warm and engaging. So, um, you know, let me, let me set that record straight. Um, I'm having to readjust my thinking about some things. Um, but uh, it was a very nice event, and I was very appreciative of him showing up uh, and making the event even nicer than, than I had expected. So, um, it's a two-year appointment. And as I understand it, the Poet Laureate is to promote literature around the state of Kentucky, uh, which I'm very much looking forward to doing. I am an educator, uh, and so I, I love talking it up uh, in my classes. Um, one of the things that I really love about teaching, uh, especially at Bellarmine, is um, I do a general education literature course, um, you know, literature for nursing students, for whoever. They have, they have to take it. Uh, and I really enjoy getting them into my class. And I just do modern American poetry, because that's my thing. And I love to turn them on to poetry. Um, now, typically, I canvass them on the first day and ask them what their experience in high school with poetry was. And this is nothing against high school teachers. Bless their hearts. Uh, they're, they're in the trenches. Uh, and I think they get nervous around poetry. So, you know, uh, I love them. Uh, but I asked them about their experience. And generally, it was not pleasant. Um, and I tell them that when I was in high school, I did not like poetry because it was not well taught. Um, in fact, in high school, Mark and Judy might remember, we had a teacher, an English teacher, Miss Binkley, who taught us poetry. And we disliked her so much <laughs> that one day, Tony Flannery took all the screws out of her lectern. Oh, no. And when she plopped her big literature book on it, the thing collapsed. <laughs> 
to the floor in a heap of dust, which we should not have done. That was not, that was not nice. <laughs> but that is the degree to which we did not like the way we were receiving poetry. Um, I was reading it and writing it on my own at home, but when I would get to school, um, I hated it. Um, so I will ask them, um, you know, how many of you in high school, and I, I know poetry is difficult to teach, especially if you're not a poet. Um, how many of you were asked in high school to find the hidden meaning of a poem? All hands go up. I know. I know. Uh, and again, bless their hearts. They're trying. Um, but I tell them that, you know, I'm, I'm a poet. I have lots of friends who are poets, and none of us hides the meaning of our poems. <laughs> Where would we hide them? <laughs> you know, poems do not come with attics and basements and closets and secret drawers. I, I don't know where we would put it. Um, and furthermore, we all know, and if you've been there, you know this, that when you're asked to find the hidden meaning of a poem, you know that the teacher is sitting on one interpretation of that poem that they want you to guess. And that's not fun. That's not fun at all. And I don't know that it has any educational value. Um, furthermore, let's say that a student read the poem the night before and maybe didn't really understand it but felt something. Maybe there was a line or an image that spoke to them, that drew them out of themselves a little bit. Um, not that they could explain what they felt, but they felt something. Uh, because what poetry does, first and foremost, is educate the emotions. Uh, you know, to, I think the brain is the last part of the body to appreciate a poem. A poem enters the body through the skin, the gut, the eyes, the ears. Um, but let's say that they felt something. And then they go into class the next day, and the teacher asks them to find the hidden meaning. Well, that right away invalidates their aesthetic experience of the night before because it wasn't hidden. So you shut them down right off the bat. Uh, and I, I really try to, to avoid that. Um, I also ask them uh, if they were ever asked the question, what was the poet trying to say? in this poem, which I always viewed suspiciously, that the poet tried but failed to say <laughs> what, and so we, you know, we are going to like fix Emily Dickinson. Uh, no, we're not. We're not going to fix Emily Dickinson. There's no fixing Emily Dickinson. Um, no, the poet said what the poet said, and that's, that, that's what, what you have. Um, so my approach is to, to try to empower them to feel that they are the equal makers of meaning in any poem that they read. Because we're all reading the same poem, but we're all different people, and we have different backgrounds. And they're going to be sent in disparate directions when they read the same poem. And what I want to know from them is, what is your experience of this poem? Don't ask the poet, don't ask me, don't ask the critics what it means. What do you do with it? Because that's, that's the meaning anyway. Uh, and if there's a certain meaning that the critics or I or someone else has, well, so what? Uh, that does, that's not going to mean what, what it can mean personally to them. Um, um, my, my touchstone in all of this, um, and I always go back to this, is that when we were children, we had a great love of poetry. We all did. Uh, children delight in meaning and sound and puzzles and words. Um, children are themselves natural poets. And I think something in the educational system teaches the joy of poetry out of them over time. Uh, and I like to try to reinstate that joy. Um, a couple of examples. Um, when my older son, Sam, 
who's here tonight, uh, was maybe four or five years old. He was in the yard stabbing things with a stick, like bushes, you know, not the dog, uh, <laughs> bushes and whatnot. And, and I went out and I made the sort of stupid father comment that looks like a cool sword. You know, simile, it looks like a sword. We all know it's a stick, and you're pretending that it's a sword. Uh, that's basically what I, what I said. Well, he stopped what he was doing and looked at me with his gray-green eyes, and he said, it is a sword. Metaphor. In his hands, uh, that was not a stick. That was, you know, a sword. Uh, King Arthur's sword, right? Um, when I think, I think it was Sam who was in the fourth grade, and I went in one day to do poetry day with the class. Um, and I had an idea. I went to the grocery store and I bought a sack of fruits and vegetables. The strangest fruits and vegetables I could find, uh, hoping that they were things they hadn't seen before, like okra, ugly fruit, uh, a lot of coconut, um, whatever. And they each got to pick one, pick a fruit or vegetable and play with it, cut it open, taste it, whatever. And then I asked them a series of questions, but I wanted them to answer in the voice of the fruit or vegetable they had chosen. Use their imaginations, you know. Who is broccoli's best friend? Well, you have to think about that a little bit. Um, where does um, spinach go on vacation, right? There's a series of questions that I asked them. And I still remember the girl who picked the coconut. There wasn't a lot she could do with it. There weren't, there weren't any rocks there to smash it open on. Uh, she could feel it, you know, the hair on the outside. Um, she could shake it and hear the milk inside. And I still remember what she wrote in response to the last question, which was, where do you go on vacation? Speaking in the voice of the coconut, she wrote, I never have to go on vacation because I carry the waves inside me. <laughs> I know. Fourth grade, 10 years old. And that was the line she came up with. And what I was really gratified with was that every kid in the room, all the other 10-year-olds, they did the same thing you just did. They all went, oh. They got it right away. And, and so, you know, that tells me that, that poetry is an intimate thing that should be accessible. We should get it right away. It's not like a literary Rubik's Cube where you have to figure it out. That's, that's no fun. Uh, I like getting a feeling from a poem and then reading it again not to figure it out, but to get that feeling again. Um, and, and children, I, I keep going back to children, they have a wonderful creative intelligence. Um, there's, there's a wonderful TED talk, and I'm gonna crib from this TED talk, um, a British educator who was talking about a Christmas pageant, and if you went to a Catholic grade school, you know about Christmas pageants. Um, and this one school put it on, and um, they picked, for the three wise men, they picked three first grade boys to bring in to the manger the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And, you know, what does frankincense mean to a first grade boy? He has no idea what that is, right? They just told him to do it. So they get out of order, but that doesn't matter. Uh, the first boy brings his box and sets it down by the manger and says, I bring you gold. The second boy brings his box in and puts it down by the manger and says, I bring you myrrh. The third boy brings his box in, puts it down by the manger and says, Frank sent this. Frank sent this, <laughs> which I think is brilliant. I, I mean, that, that's, you know, that is a kid 
making sense out of nonsense. Uh, and of course that's what he would say, because frankincense is a meaningless word, so he, he, he reconstrues it in his mind to make it mean something. Uh, so so I, you know, I'm really inspired by kids' um, intuitional and creative problem solving. Uh, and when you work with kids, um, it's really, it's, it's enlightening. Um, and I never tell that story that I don't think about Frank Sinatra. And a friend of mine who was a sound engineer and did one of his CDs told me the story about Frank Sinatra. Whatever you think about Frank Sinatra. Um, at his Palm Springs house, inside the front doors, on either side, there was a pedestal. Uh, and each pedestal, there was this beautiful blown glass piece of sculpture. Uh, very expensive, I imagine. And some guys came over to visit, and one of the guys on entering the house bumped into one of the pedestals and knocked the glass sculpture off, and it shattered on the floor. And what Frank Sinatra did was shove the other one off and smash it on the floor so the guy wouldn't feel bad. And I'm like, you know, that tells me something about the man. Uh, whatever else you think, you know, mafia, I don't care. Uh, he did that for a friend. Um, so um, I thought I would read a few poems, and then we can open it up to um, questions, a conversation, whatever's on your mind. Um, not that I can answer them, but we'll give it a try. Um, Poetry, for me, um, I sometimes feel like I can't really lay claim to the poems that I write. They just sort of happen. Uh, Charles Simic is a writer I really love. And he's made the comment that what most critics don't understand is that poems mostly write themselves. Uh, you have to be alert to the conditions of poetry. Um, you have to, one, you have to notice things, and then you have to try to get that notice down into language somehow, and then you hope to have the leisure to turn that language into poetry. Uh, now, it doesn't always work. Usually it doesn't work. Um, and, and there are poems of mine that I, that I can say I do not really understand that I've written. Um, and I tell this to my students, too. I say, you know, I've written poems I can't explain to you. So, you know, don't look to me. For, look to yourself for the answers. Um, the best example of that is a poem that I wrote um, that came out of a trip to Washington, D.C. Um, for a few years, I took honors students at Bellarmine on their senior trip. And I found this great hotel in DC that was right near the mall, so we could go to all the free museums. Um, and this was the year that none of the guys in the cohort could go. All the guys in the senior class had conflicts. So it was a little weird. It was me, me and seven or eight young women going to DC for the weekend. Um, and, and the weirdest point was um, I taught them a, a class, a senior class, honors class in art and aesthetics. And so I always, in the years that I took them, I always asked them to bring a nice change of clothes and some money because I wanted to take them out for a, a nice meal at a nice restaurant. You know, because for students, you know, Qdoba might be fine cuisine and I wanted them to experience something better. Uh, so this year, um, I and seven or eight young women, all dolled up, went to a restaurant, I think in the Reagan building, uh, for a nice meal. And we were seated, and the waiter was handing the menus around. And when he got to me, he leaned down and he whispered into my ear, you must tell me your secret. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. I, I mean, you can't say go into education because that sounds real wrong, you know. Um, but it was that weekend and I was sitting on a bench on the mall and this bee suddenly just fell into my lap. And I went to brush it off, like you do, 
Uh, but I realized that it was two bees. And, and they were, you know, this is the new international symbol for doing it, right? <laughs> they, were, they, were, uh, they rolled off my lap into the grass. Um, and I watched. You know. <laughs> and then after they were done, uh, the male, female, I guess, I don't know, flew away, and the male just lit up a cigarette. No. <laughs> the male just flew in little circles around that spot. And, and later on, I was, I was in my hotel room just writing down in, in a journal the things that had happened that day, and I wrote down what I just told you. Uh, and then a phrase popped into my head. Um, after they finished making love, uh, this phrase appeared, and I wrote it down, and the phrase is, the grass, the air, now sweet with the honey of future days. Which I can't explain, and I don't even want to try to, uh, but it just appeared. And so there, it was a gift from the universe, and, and there it is. Um, so, so I feel like poetry, if you notice things, and then you try to wrangle them into language, um, sometimes you get lucky, and, and that's, that's what you hope for. Um, poetry also comes from poetry, art comes from art. Uh, I, I wrote a whole book of poems in response to a book of poems by a Norwegian poet. Uh, I don't know that you could tell the, inf the influence. Um, I don't think they link up in that way, but I would read him and, th and things would just come to me. And so it was a doorway through which I walked one summer, uh, if, if that makes sense. Um, and my poems tend to be short. Um, I find that the older I get, the less I have to say. Uh, Charles Wright is a poet I really like, had a line, uh, there's so much time and so little to say. And I feel like that more and more, uh, which might not be good. Um, um, this poem is just about, a, the title is The Forest. Uh, it's in Norwegian, Oksskogen is the Norwegian word for the forest. And there's this idea in one of his poems about every forest having a central tree, which I found really intriguing. Uh, so this is the poem that came. Every forest has a central tree, one the whole forest leans on. You may not be able to find it, it lives deep in the heart. It may even have fallen years ago, but its memory is that strong. And again, don't ask me to explain. I have no idea what, what that is. Um, a couple of the poems from this book were actually read by Garrison Keillor on his radio program, um, The other one, uh, the poet's, the poet's almanac. Yes, um, and so I feel a little sheepish reading it. I mean, I really want to be able to bring Garrison Keillor out from the wings to read it in his, you know, wonderfully mellifluous NPR voice, uh, which I can't do. Um, so I'll I'll, I'll approximate. Uh, this one is just called Morning. All year long, there is the table by the window, blue cups with white rims, the black teapot. There are sometimes flowers when we remember. There are paisley napkins and always oranges. The window looks down into a courtyard and sometimes up into blue sky. I don't know how that came, but I, I, afterwards, I just love the idea of the window having agency, of being able to look up or down. Um, <laughs> when, when my younger son, Ben, who's here, um, the, the bane of my existence when my sons were growing up was the annual uh, science fair project, <laughs> because I know nothing about science. And there are only so many years you can stick a dandelion into blue water and have it get anything above a C, right? Um, and 
and, we, and it, it rolled around again, and we were agonizing over what we were going to do. And somehow we hit on the idea uh, of the camera oscura, which is something that Aristotle did, where I, I cannot explain it to you, uh, but you, you crawl under a blanket on a sunny day, and you've got a tube with a, covered with a hole in it and paper and a pencil, and somehow you can see the, the shapes, the patterns on the moon on this piece of paper. I'm explaining this really badly, I know. <laughs> um, but it works. Believe me, it, it, it works. And, and that's, what we, that's what he did. Uh, and I was so pleased. He comes out from under the blanket, and on this piece of paper, he has drawn an image of, of the moon with its seas and other topographical details. Uh, and I thought, that should get an A, right? Because, you know, there are kids who are building nuclear reactors in their basements with their engineer fathers for these things. So how do you compete, right? Um, so, uh, so this is the poem that, that accompanied that science fair project, um, Camera Oscura. Other boys built centrifuges, stone polishers, water wheels. My boy chose a Camera Oscura for the fall term science fair. He crawled under a blanket with pencil, paper, pinhole, and doodled what he saw in his eye's mind. Lunar seas, a subtlety of shadows in the ferocity of a September sun. When he emerged, blinking, he held the moon in his palm, an ancient medallion also worn by Aristotle and Anthemius of Trellis. And I love the idea, and I don't know where that came from either, of sort of connecting him to this ancient thing. Uh, yes, Aristotle did this, and my son did this too. Uh, and did you get an A? Yes. <laughs> When I was in middle school, I did a report on the Kentucky writer Jesse Stewart, uh, who I loved. I'd read his books uh, as a kid um, and, and loved them all. Uh, and whenever he had a new book come out, he would come into town, into Louisville, uh, and Stewart's department store had a book section, and they would put him at a card table. Uh, and I, my mother would always take me, and I would buy a book, and he would sign it for me, and I would shake his big, meaty hand. Um, and I did a report on him in school, and, and we had a brief correspondence. And I asked him questions in the mail, and he would answer me back. Um, and in his last letter to me, uh, he added at the end, I hope you get an A on this report. And I, of course, included that letter in my report. <laughs> uh, and got an A. So, yeah. um, this is the other poem that, that Garris Akila read um, on his program. And, and the poet's almanac actually pays well. I got like $100 per poem, um, which was, was just gravy. Um, and, and I should explain, uh, this collection has a blurb on the back from the New Yorker. Uh, which I need to explain. Um, I've, I've been through the entire hierarchy of rejection with the New Yorker magazine. Um, it started, like most poets, you know, with a, form, a small form rejection, and then a small form rejection with a thank you, somebody wrote in the corner, and then a larger form rejection note, and then the larger rejection note with a thank you in the corner. I'm slowly moving up the ladder here. Um, then a very brief typed rejection from the poetry editor, Alice Quinn, and then a longer typed rejection letter from the editor, Alice Quinn, and then a handwritten letter in her lavender ink from Alice Quinn saying this poem got really close. <laughs> and I'm thinking, next time. And then she freaking retires. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and there's a new guy. And I start all over again at the bottom with the new guy. Um, but, and, and I got a form rejection back, uh, and somebody had written on the form rejection, thank you for these spare and wise poems. And I thought, damn it, I'm going to use that. Uh, and I have the rejection note to prove that that, that that was written on the rejection note. So that's the blurb from the New Yorker. Uh, that's, that's my explanation of that. Um, so one more poem, and then I think I'll read a, a very brief, like, one-page essay from, from this new book that's just out. Um, and then we'll open it up to conversation. Um, uh, this poem is just titled Moon. And, and if you can, um, imagine that it's Garrison Keillor's voice you're hearing read this poem. Okay. The day lengthens. The old earth tips its hat to the moon. The changeful moon goes through many phases, even in a single night. Though it is the same moon as ever, we know this. We are the changes. And again, don't ask me what it means. <laughs> I don't have a clue. Um, and I think it should be mysterious. I mean, I, you know, it's one of the things I talk about with my students is being comfortable with mystery. Um, there's a Wendell Berry poem I teach. You know, Wendell is, uh, Wendell Berry is um, very much a conservationist and, and honors the mystery of the universe. Uh, there's a poem of his, uh, The Manifesto of the Bad Farmer's Liberation Front where he says, praise ignorance, for what man has not encountered, he has not destroyed. And we read that poem, and we read that line, and I say to them, so what do you think? You know, we're sitting in a college classroom, and we're reading a poem that has the line, praise ignorance. What do you think about that? And they're, and they're a little befuddled, which I think is a good way to leave them some days. Um, but I will also ask them, you know, now did any of you grow up in a Catholic church where you switched from mass in Latin to mass in English? And did any of you grow up in a congregation where you switched back to Latin? And I've had a few, uh, and there have been some. And the comment is that when mass was switched to English and they understood every word, it was no longer a spiritual event. What they needed was the mystery of the Latin for it to be a spiritual occasion. And so they went back to it. And so I say to them, look, get comfortable with mystery. It's OK. You don't have to understand everything. Um, OK, let me read um, the opening essay in this little book. And the essays are really, really little. Um, there was a Japanese writer in the 50s, uh, Yasunara Kawabata, who wrote these one-page short stories that were wonderful and complete. And he called them palm of the hand stories. They were so small they would fit in the palm of your hand. Uh, so these essays I call palm of the hand essays. Um, and this one is titled On Joy. It has been my fortune in this life to live as a poet, to read poetry, to write it, to teach it, and to have found long minutes in which to sit in meditation with poetry. What does this mean? Call it the afterglow or the sublime. When Longinus used the word sublime, he meant all that is noble and grand, generous and affecting. I do not think Longinus thought in elitist ways. In fact, I might correct myself and substitute the words fine and important. As after making love, the feeling of having read a good poem induces a certain inner radiance. The poem sinks in and transforms itself from words on a page to a deep interior shift. My second wife, who was a yoga teacher, spoke of a rootedness that occurs in her practice. I think that is a good word for what I'm trying to describe. One feels anchored to the earth in a new way. The Harvard scholar Helen Vindler speaks of reflection as a proper response to poetry. 
and I agree with her. Quiet reflection is how I often respond to poetry. I like the reading of poems, and I also like the states of mind in which they leave me. Louise Glick, in her essay, Education of the Poet, says, quote, I loved those poems that seemed so small on the page, but swelled in the mind, end quote. So poetry, then, is a lovely kind of fever. Every so often, I reread Basho's Narrow Road to the Interior, in part to be reminded of first things, friendship, awareness, the act of putting one foot in front of another. I read Sam Hamill's translation from Shambhala. His version is pared down. Each little chapter reads like a prose haiku or a tanka. And then, to look up from the page and to gaze out at the muscular limbs of the pear trees enclosing my balcony, it is like taking a deep drink from a cold mountain lake. It is bracing. In the afterglow of Basho's words, I feel at peace with the world and a little moved beyond myself. Poetry may leave us, as it did Wordsworth, amid thought too deep for tears, and those just might be tears of joy. Poetry educates the emotions, so we are freed from having to assess it. Drear word. The feeling that stays with us is the first important thing. So, um, questions or thoughts or comments, uh, things that are on your mind, and, and we can just open it up. And, um, I promise not to have all the answers. Um, yes? How long is your longest poem that has been published? I'm running out of words, I think. Um, well, you know, when you're young, you, you talk a lot. And, um, and I'm, I'm also I'm influenced by uh, a lot of um, Asian and Scandinavian poetry, which tends to be brief, quick on the uptake. Uh, and I like that sharp image that um, can, can spark something and not go on too long. You know, it's kind of the, the, the tru truism about pop songs. Uh, if your pop song is two minutes long, people might want to hear it again. If it's eight minutes long, like, I never want to hear that song again, right? So, you know, stop before you bore them. Yeah. Yeah. How about haiku? Do you do haiku? Um, I don't, um, but I, a new book that's coming out from uh, Larkspur this fall is, uh, it's all five-line poems. Uh, and in Japanese, that would be a tanka. Uh, so uh, I don't do haiku. I find haiku to be really difficult. And, and I also worry a little bit about cultural appropriation. Um, you know, when you borrow something from another culture, um, it, it's a, it can be a little bit of an invasion. And I would want to feel that I'm doing it really well. And I'm not sure I could do it well enough to, to borrow in that way. I also have trouble writing in, in rigid forms. Um, I can't do it. I, I can't convincingly rhyme. Um, I have friends who can do it, and they're wonderful at it. Uh, but again, the, the bar is set really high. Um, to write a convincing rhyming poem anymore these days is really difficult to do. Um, and I remember somebody saying about writing in form, you know, like a, a villanelle or a sonnet that comes with all these mechanical requirements, you know, the meter and rhyme and, and all that, um, that form for a formalist poet is like a straitjacket, the way that a straitjacket was a straitjacket for Houdini. It, it released his creativity. Um, and, and for me, it just stifles it, so I can't. But I have a friend who teaches at Drexel University in uh, Philadelphia, and it's a, it's a lot of uh, mechanical engineering students. And they love writing sonnets, because it, it's like building a machine. You know, all these requirements, and you have to plug in all the words, right? They're not writing great poetry, but they're following the form, so. 
So what was the process to writing your first book and having it published, and how did you navigate that? Did you have any sort of advisors or anybody in the industry that was helping you? I had no idea what I was doing, none whatsoever. Um, you know, you, as a young writer, you, you write these things, and then you, like, then you think, well, okay, now what do I do with it? Um, and I think, I think I speak for a lot of us when I say that we're very slow to figure out what to do with what you've written. Uh, eventually, and I, was, I did not publish my first book until I was maybe 40-ish, although I'd been writing all my life. Um, but there was a, a, a regional publisher, Larkspur, uh, in Monterey, Kentucky, that I'd heard of, and I sent them a manuscript. And uh, to my great good fortune, they, they took it. Uh, and they and another regional publisher, Broadstone, um, have been pretty much my only publishers. Um, and you know, you want to publish with the big boys. Uh, I, actually, <laughs> I actually sent a manuscript of poems to uh, Random House, uh, to Knopf, when I was like in my 20s, which was stupid. It's like, it's like buying a lottery ticket, you know, it's not going to pay off. And I sent it to Harry Ford, the legendary poetry editor at Knopf. Um, and I got a handwritten letter back from Harry Ford, which was really nice of him, because it was nowhere near, I know it was nowhere near anything they wanted. Um, but anymore, um, most people publish with small, what's known as small press. Um, because big press, one, doesn't do poetry. Uh, and the funnel is so narrow. And, and what you want is, um, what you want is not fame. What you want is a good publisher, someone who will treat your words with respect and beauty, um, which is what small publishers do. So I'm, I'm happy as could be publishing with Larkspur and Broadstone. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned a couple of times reading Scandinavian poets. Do you read in the language that they wrote or a translation? And I'm very curious about the process of translating poetry. It seems so, so difficult in my mind. I'm just wondering what you might comment on that. Um, I read a little bit of Swedish, but that's all. Uh, and I can't, I really can't say that I read the poems in their original language. Uh, I need a bilingual edition to make any headway. Um, but one summer, I taught in Denmark and Sweden and, and just fell in love with a whole Scandinavian kind of ethos, I guess. Um, and, and one of the great things about Northern Europe is that we were we were in Copenhagen most of the time, but you're so close to other places, you could like go to Sweden for lunch and then come back, uh, and it was great. Um, so I, I, I know Spanish, I know a little French, uh, and I can read poetry in those languages, but uh, Swedish and Danish, no. I mean, I tried to learn some Danish when I went, but we in the West are so, flat and nasal, and Danish comes from down here, like deep in the throat. You know, I would need like a surgical procedure to be able to learn <laughs> Danish. So I gave up after a bit. Um, but one time I translated a book of poems from Russian into English, and I don't know any Russian. And what happened was this woman somehow found my work and contacted me, and what we did was she, who spoke no English, and her husband, who spoke a little English, got a Russian-English dictionary and made like a word-for-word -word transliteration of her poems, which they then sent to me and said, turn this into poetry. So I played with it, and we sent it back and forth until everybody was happy with, with what we had. Uh, and, and it got published. You know, go figure. Um, and I've seen, I've seen poems of mine translated into Spanish. Um, and I, they don't have the same feeling for me, but it, it, that probably doesn't matter at all. Um, who was it who said, 
poetry is what gets lost in translation. Uh, I don't agree with that, but you know, there, there is this transaction that happens. And I think some things get gained and some things get lost. And it's probably natural in that way. How do you envision the next two years as Poet Laureate unfolding? I mean, what will be your role as opposed to teaching? Will you continue to teach or will you just be on the road doing these sorts of things? How does that look for the next two years, do you think? Um, no, I'll still be, I'll keep my day job. Yeah, I, I'll still be teaching at Bellarmine. Uh, to Bellarmine's great credit, they've given me a course release over the next two years so that I'll have time to be on the road. Um, and, and you're charged with the mission of promoting literature around the state, uh, which I've been told by former Poets Laureate uh, means accepting every invitation you get uh, as much as you can. Uh, and so, so far my fall looks like pretty much every weekend I've got a trip somewhere to go give a talk or a reading, a workshop, uh, whatever. Um, uh, so I, I'm, you know, I mean, as an educator, I'm looking forward to broadening the people I talk to beyond my classroom, uh, and I really want to bring it to as many people as I can. Uh, my predecessor in this role, George Ella Lyon, is a wonderful poet, and her project was uh, she'd written a poem called "Where I'm From." She's from Harlan County, and has a wonderful poem where I'm from, and she encouraged people to write their own where I'm from poems, and she has a kind of archive of those poems, which are wonderful. Um, my project is going to be to get people to read poetry. Uh, I, want, I want, because if you're gonna write it, you need to read it. Uh, I've had students who say, you know, in my creative writing classes, I've had a student say, you know, well, I like to write poetry, but I don't like to read it. <laughs> like, what are you, Michael Jordan? You just show up on game day and you're ready to go? You know? um, so I really want to encourage the reading of poetry. Um, and it also keeps me from having to do a, you know, a computer database, which doesn't interest me at all. Um, but yeah, I just want to talk up the reading of poetry and, and, and the feelings that come from it. Um, you know, there's, there's so many times in the classroom where I've been astounded by things that, that students have said in response to poems that we've looked at. Uh, that, is, that, is, that called up things in these students that I don't think they expected, and certainly I didn't expect. Uh, and so it's that nice surprise that happens. Uh, and I just, you know, it's lovely when it does, and I'd like to see it happen more often, so yeah. Uh, have you found that your mystery or your ethos has changed with age? From the perspective of older age, um, yeah, I'm, I'm much more serious about it. Um, I'm not in as much of a hurry. I think when you're young, I mean, I know when I was young, I was in a hurry to get things written and get them published. Uh, and now, um, now I'm taking my time. Um, and, you know, time is, is relative also. Um, there's a poem I teach, uh, Ezra Pound's uh, The River Merchant's Wife, a letter where this woman, she's 15, 16 years old, her husband has gone away, he works on a river boat and she's writing him this letter because she misses him so much. And she says, you've been gone for five months, and that just feels like an eternity to her. And so we talk about age being relative. You know, like when you were four years old, it seemed like forever before Christmas came around again because you have to wait a fourth of your life for it to return. But I said, you know, when you're like 90, you only wait a 90th of your life it's like Christmas comes every freaking two weeks, you know? <laughs> Which is why I think old people don't take down their Christmas decorations. We just have <laughs> put, put them right back up again, right? Um, so, um, 
yeah, there's, there's a, um, I think a, a ripening slowness that I've found comes with age uh, that's comfortable. Um, and and I, I, I hope to live a long time to, to feel it even more. Uh, you know, yeah. I hope that doesn't end soon. Yeah, yeah. I had an eighth grade teacher who had us diagram poems <laughs> to help us understand them better. Bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I remember diagramming sentences, uh, and, and it, was a, it was a big help. Uh, and I'll tell you, um, one of the reasons that I miss Barack Obama is that when he would speak, his sentences would diagram themselves in my mind, and it was beautiful. Um, it doesn't happen so much anymore. <laughs> I guess um, I've taken some pleasure in, in having memorized some poems or some lines from poems. And as a retired educator, I would challenge my students, invite them perhaps to memorize mm -hmm. just something because it can stick with you later on. You never know. How do you feel about, because teachers don't often, we, back in the day maybe we would memorize things. How do you feel about challenging your students to memorize something? I like doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, there's a poem by Robert Bly uh, that I, I recite to them, sort of as a model. Uh, it's a poem called What is Provided. It's very short, and I, I have them write it down. Uh, and the poem goes like this. Uh, Every breath taken in by the man who loves and the woman who loves goes to fill the water tank where the spirit horses drink. It's a beautiful poem. And, and I explain to them you know, that my take on it is, you know, the first two lines of that poem are fairly straightforward syntactically. Every breath taken in by the man who loves and the woman who loves. Sounds like it's going to be a poem about what love is. But you can't really say what love is. And so the second two lines, goes to fill the water tank where the spirit horses drink. It's magical and unexpected. And that's kind of what love is. It's magical and unexpected. So you can't say what love is, but the poem, I think, does what love is. So I, I give them the poem, I, say, I recite the poem, write it down. When Valentine's Day rolls around, <laughs> buy a card. The poem was free. <laughs> buy a nice card, write this poem in it, and you're good to go. You know, <laughs> get the flowers and the chocolate, you're, you're covered. Uh, you can even sign your name to it. I don't think Robert Bly would mind. Uh, but yeah, if, when you memorize a poem, you've always got it with you. Um, and, and it's sort of, it's a nice thing to have in your mind. You know, there's so much noise and distraction out there in the world. And to have the calm, still moment of a poem in mind, in the forefront of your mind, I think is much better for you. Um, psychically, psychology, you know, than, than what we tend to have. So, yeah, I'm all for it, yeah. I wanted to know if you have collaborated uh, in, in writing a song uh, ever, and, and, and also have you taught songs in your class, uh, you know, as poetry? And then the last part is a comment on Bob Dylan's recent award. Oh. oh. <laughs> You're opening up that can of whoop ass. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, I think, I think my writing began as lyrics. Uh, I mean, I, I was the child of the 60s, so I wanted to be a songwriter, um, which didn't happen. But it, it, that was the writing impetus came from, from music. Uh, and I do incorporate songs in my classes. We listen to uh, Bruce Springsteen, we listen to Dylan. Uh, we listen to uh, Procol Harum, A Wider Shade of Pale, references uh, Chaucer's uh, tales. Um, and there are quite a number of, of song lyrics that you see in literature textbooks. Uh, and then when my students present, you know, I ask them at the end of the class, you know, you find a poem and share it with us. And I let them use songs. Uh, and they often bring in things I never would have thought of. Um, that are quite wonderful, and when you, listen, when you listen to a song and look at the lyrics, 
in the context of a literature class, a poetry class, you see it in a different way. Um, now, I've never collaborated, um, I don't think, but I would be open to it. I mean, I would collaborate. I wouldn't collude, but I would collaborate. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So, yeah. You've talked about both of your sons as you've been here, and obviously you've been writing your whole life. And so you were writing when you were a father of young children, and I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old now. And I have found so much that I mourn the time and the space, the mm. solitary energy that I was able to dedicate, as you know, to being a poet. And how did you do it? How did you, when, when they were little, how did you find the time, the emotional energy, all of it, to sit down and continue writing? It's, it's a struggle. Um, the good thing is that I don't write novels. <laughs> you know, poems are short, and they happen, for me, they happen quickly. Um, and, and again, you know, my sons were of a certain age before I really started publishing, uh, although I was always interested in it, I was always scribbling. But I think it, I was also a, a long time in getting, getting any good at it. Uh, the British poet Hilda Doolittle uh, would lock herself in her study, and her two-year-old daughter at, at the time, uh, Perdita, who names their daughter Perdita? Lost one, but <laughs> anyway. Perdita would, would throw herself at the door and scream and bang on it, and she would not unlock it. Her partner would have to come and take the child away. Um, I, you know, I, I, that's not me. Uh, I think... I think if you're writing poetry, um, you can always have a notebook in your lap. Um, was it Charlotte Bronte who never had a desk or a room of her own? She wrote all of her novels on her lap in the living room. And whenever somebody came in and needed like a cup of tea, she would go make it for them. So she wrote her novels in public and under constant interruption. So it can be done. Um, if you're writing a novel, I think you have to set boundaries. Uh, but for me, poetry is of the moment and can just happen. And so I don't, and if I isolate myself or if I say I'm going to go write, well, I've jinxed myself. I'm not going to write a thing that day, right? You know, it's not going to happen. Um, but everybody's different. Um, the, uh, the writer, and I always blank on his name, one, wonderful writer in New York City, um, Gay Talese. Um, he and his wife live in a brownstone uh, somewhere in New York. And every morning he gets up and bathes and has breakfast with his wife and dresses up and leaves the house and goes down to the basement where his office is. And he works there all day long. And it's the separation of life and office, even though it's that close together. Um, but that's the routine that works for him. Uh, Louis Erdrich, who has like seven kids, gets up at four in the morning and writes for those couple of hours before her kids wake up. Uh, so you see writers doing all kinds of things to set parameters for themselves and free up time. Um, and they all do it differently. Um, you just have to figure out what really works for you um, and, and stick to it. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, there, I, I'll stick around and, and sign books if you want, uh, but I really appreciate you coming out um, and showing up uh, and, and not interrupting me, uh, letting me talk on and on and on. So again, thank you very much. This has been a Metro TV production.